potencial. Um, uh, which is world renowned in the field of risk and disaster reduction. Um, so we, um, and David has been key to building up that reputation and drawing in the next generation of researchers, academics and leaders in this field. Um, so as David and Ian wind down their esteemed careers in disaster risk reduction, it's a great honor to publish this report beginning with key advances in the field of disaster risk reduction um, from during their careers and even the time before that, and moving on to the current discussion points. And of course, as an institute, we always want to host this type of, of discussion of, of uh, intellectual rigor to see the, the differences we have, but challenging each other as, as we um, make advances and improve our understanding in that way. Um, I believe that this will be a key reference for students and academics for many years to come and encourage you all to read it and find out more from the rest of our speakers today. And thank you. With that, I'll hand over to, I think it's Professor Manisha Ramesh from the welcome from our co-host. Thank you very much indeed uh, for your very kind words, Rosie. And so um, I pass the floor to uh, Professor uh, Manisha. Ramesh, the Dean of the School of Sustainable Development at Amrita Vishwa Vidyapitham University, Kerala. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor David. Uh, a warm good afternoon to all. I would like to welcome one and all to the online launch of the report, A Glass Half Full or Half Empty, a Dialogue on Progress in Disaster Risk Reduction. I am Dr. Manisha Ramesh. I'm the, currently the Provost for Research, Innovation and Internationalization at Amrita Vishwa Vidya Pidam. Vishwa Vidya Pidam means university, so that you can call it as Amrita University. And I'm also the Dean of School for Sustainable Development. And uh, it's fortunate that I have been part of this university, which is established by the world-renowned humanitarian leader, Sri Mata Amritanthamai Devi. And her vision has made this university into a multidisciplinary, multi-campus research intensive university. And to work on global challenges through a compassion-driven approach is our motto. And it's my absolute delight to co-host this event on behalf of Amrita along with University College London. And I would also like to express my heartfelt congratulations to the authors, Professor Ian Davis and Professor David E. Alexander for bringing out the unique experiences and perceptions of 36 contributors from around the world who have contributed to highlighting the contributions and pitfalls in achieving disaster, disaster risk reduction. For any individual who is working in this area, this is a gold mine, the world's best experts bringing in best of their knowledge into us and for that the future generation can benefit. And thank you to one and all, uh, each of the contributor who has been part of this document. Amrita University's core vision, as I said, that it is, it is majorly looking into education for life where we believe in the values is, as the foundation and building on compassion driven research and also working on global challenges to provide global impact. And the way we are looking into it is anything we work on, bring in the innovative thinking, multidisciplinary research and in-depth understanding of societal challenges so that the researchers at Amrita strive to develop solutions with real world applications for betterment of society to meet the need of a sustainable future. The major, one of the major key thematic area Amrita is always in forefront is the disaster risk reduction and community level disaster resilience, building community level disaster resilience. Both the parent organization, Mata Amrita Andamai Mat, and also the university, Amrita Vishavidya Pidam, is been in the forefront in the country for this. It's been a long time they have worked on multiple disasters, whether it is the Gujarat earthquake, whether it is tsunami, whether it is the hurricane, all the different aspects they have worked on on different multi-hazards. And this has given us a lot of insight into it. 
which has translated into different research work also, where today we have deployed the world's first IoT system for real-time monitoring and early warning of landslides and also for monitoring of multi-hazard systems. And we also work very closely with the community where our, our, our major encouragement and motivation is to bring in the capacities in the communities to take care of disaster resilience. And how you will equip or empower the community in making a resilient community among them itself. And in this regard, we have worked on a lot of crowdsourced applications. And also at, at the same way, we, have, we, are, we are working on a lot of behavioral related behavioral change related research in the university. And we are very happy to say that this has been, this endeavor has been become a better way and has a more future prospects by Professor Ian joining as the adjunct faculty and the advisor for the School for Sustainable Development. And also Professor Vinod Menon also joining as the advisor and the adjunct faculty for the university. They both are today spearheading the disaster resilience for this university along with other fa faculty members in which Dr. Sudha Alikad, who is also one of the key author for the one of the um, one of the person who has contributed in this particular document. She's also the, uh, the professor at the School for Sustainable Development. So this group, uh, it, there is a lot of younger generation and also the experienced faculty is contributing for us to build in the capacity development programs and also educational materials, which can be taken forward to handle the climate change impacts and also to build disaster risk reduction and community level disaster risk resilience management in each of the communities. And we are working with more than 108 communities and we are taking forward in that uh, direction. And I would also like to congratulate and appreciate Professor Sudha Alikat, Professor Vinod Menon and Professor Ian Davis from Amata's side for working on this, on this particular project. And I sincerely, hope and pray the report opens doors to reshape and reimagine the conversations on disaster risk reduction and truly make a change in the area. And we sh should be able to globally work on this, this, uh, this work and we should be able to globally work on the, these needs, which is the, uh, the community is facing and make a big difference based on the expert knowledge, which is there in the document. Thank you, everybody. Looking forward to work with each one of you and welcome one and all to them. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Dr. Zuki. Um, I mentioned this event to some Indian students of mine and they were very much awed by the fact that Amrita University was joining in. And moreover, I think you have clearly a very, very attractive campus there. It's nice to have you with us and we're grateful for your support. But now it's time to hear from the star of the show. Of course, Ian Davis needs absolutely no introduction, not the least because a good many of participants today have not merely worked with him, but contributed to this report. And in fact, it's their work as much as it is our work in many respects. But um, what we would like to do now is both give a very short overview or a perspective on what the report is about and why it was done. And of course, because Ian thought it up, he has to go first. And um, it was very much in origin, his idea. So over to you, Ian, thank you very much. Thank you all, it's a great pleasure to be with so many friends. Uh, I think it all began when I had a, a letter from a colleague, one of the contributors to this document. And um, well, we met up actually, and he was extremely pessimistic about progress in this disaster risk reduction field. And um, I, I felt, uh, I wondered, I pondered on this afterwards because I wasn't nearly so pessimistic. I felt there'd been massive progress being made in all sorts of areas. And so uh, it, it kind of troubled me. I thought, well, perhaps I'm off on a beam here. I've, I've got a different view of it all. So I wrote to about 12 friends saying, what's your assessment? Is your cup half full or half empty? when you think about progress in this field. And uh, that started the ball rolling, really. Uh, several of the 12 contacted other people and gradually it built up to no less than 36 people. And uh, they all wrote back. 
some of them contradicting the views of others. And I kept this ball rolling by sending out repeated drafts. So I suppose the spirit of this, David asks about the spirit and the purpose and the content. The spirit of this is a lot of freedom. People were not writing a, a UN report here or doing consultancy. They were just responding to some friends. Uh, there's a lot of spontaneity, a lot of freshness, quite a lot of contradictions and argument and um, occasional endorsements, occasional, um, I agree with that, but I certainly don't agree with this and this, this is clearly wrong, et cetera, et cetera. So lots of pluses, lots of minuses, lots of cups half full, lots of cups half empty. And it depended a lot on where people are standing, where they're looking at the problem, how they're looking at it, uh, or they're even perhaps their personalities. Some people are more optimistic, some less so. So that was the spirit of it. It's, a, it, I hope, a very fresh document. It became almost impossible to deal with it all. And this is where my good friend David came to the rescue by offering to help edit the thing. And David, I'm so grateful to you for sort of hammering this, this collection of stuff into some kind of coherent form. And uh, in the end, we left hardly anything out. We kept nearly everything, which is why it's a big document. The, the purpose of it, I think, is to reflect multiple opinions. And it might be quite unique. There are very few documents I can think of where lots of people contribute in chains where one person says something, somebody responds, somebody else responds, somebody diverts the conversation in different directions and so on. So it's, it's, um, it's a commentary on what's going on. Not always positive, sometimes negative, sometimes highlighting problems. Um, and uh, and I, I felt, for example, there were, it highlights some achievements. In, in the field I work in, in housing and, and shelter, it's very impressive to see people giving cash to survivors of disasters. So we're, we're not being paternalistic to the degree that we certainly were in the 70s, where we knew what was best for people. People are spending money, people are assessing their own needs. People are, through mobile phone technology, becoming extremely active in managing their own relief programs. There are many remarkable progresses, but there are also lots of setbacks. For example, it's a bit of a moving target. I mean, Ian Burton is going to comment a bit later about climate, but it seems to me that as we tackle these problems, the world's getting more and more dangerous by the day. And, and so therefore there's got to be quantum leaps in all directions to cope. Uh, and so that's a huge challenge. Uh, just about the content of it, I think it's pretty self-explanatory. We're delighted that people can get hold of this freely. They don't have to pay money. It's available to anybody. And the website, David has highlighted, but he'll highlight it again. 16 topics, 36 people, and, uh, and from coming from 19 countries. So huge thank you to everybody for their contributions. Many of them are on the screen today or might see this in recorded form. And thank you, David, for hosting this. And thank you very much in Amrita for generously letting me get involved in your university in my 86th year. I mean, I, you've got great confidence uh, and I hope I'm not going to upset apple carts and so on, but it's been a great joy to teach again and meet lots of PhD students, some on the screen and others. And, um, and I hope that we're going to make a decisive contribution. So thank you, David. Thank you very much, Ian. Well, let me add a few words myself. Um, about 15 years ago, Ian and I uh, wrote a book uh, together called Recovery from Disaster. That also was Ian's initiative that I came in to support him on. Um, we spent many weekends down at Ian's delightful country house in Devon, southwest England, going for long walks, drinking a lot of wine, talking about disaster risk reduction and the world's problems, and writing, writing, writing. In the end, I even wrote a section of this in intensive care in a hospital in Japan. Well, I was rather bored there at the time. But one initiative that Ian took in this that was quite distinctive, if not unique, was that he wrote a simple question to 51 different people who are renowned experts in their field and asked them what makes recovery from disaster work? 
So Appendix 2 of the book Recovery from Disaster includes 51 different comments and views on that particular question. So in some respects, this report is an extension at least of that technique. And um, it represents a very free and easy dialogue. In places, you might say it's even a little bit subversive. Well, so it should be. Uh, this is very much open thinking uh, at a time when we need creativity and we need a broad view of things and we need answers to some questions that are becoming increasingly desperate. So what we ended up with was a set of uh, comments and viewpoints and uh, discussion and so on that needed to be put into some kind of order. And Ian did a wonderful job of classifying all of this and putting it into an order that could be summarized at intervals through the report so that we got some sense of the unity of it and some sense of drawing the threads together of a discussion that's remarkably wide ranging. Now, the problem with that was that it ended up as being about 50,000 words, which is not really long enough for a book, and neither was it the right format for a book, but it is far too long for a journal paper. Indeed, attempts to interest journal editors in it really came to nothing because they balked at the, the size and also the form of it. Uh, but we nevertheless felt that this was a worthwhile exercise and one that was worth sharing with anyone who wants to read it because it does represent a very open dialogue between people who really know about disasters and have a huge amount of expertise and experience to share with others that we can all benefit from. So in the end, we chose an IRDR occasional paper, bearing in mind that, for example, one of the very first occasional papers, which was on the Eyjafjallajökull Fiatla Yerkel eruption of 2010 and the ash cloud that covered Europe and so on, was actually very successful and very widely read. And the fact that the papers look quite good and are open access and easily downloadable was um, very much a plus because, of course, we wanted this shared uh, wherever it could be. So I set to the task of trying to put this in some kind of format order. It was very much a scrapbook of different opinions, even though Ian had done a sterling job with putting things into a logical order and adding summaries at intervals through it. As I picked up the result this morning and looked through it again, I found yet another couple of typographical errors for which I do apologize. Uh, but nevertheless, it, it was quite a, a mammoth task to put those together. And then in the end, I got a wine glass out. I half filled it through, full of water. I put it on a balcony of my house and I photographed it for the cover. Well, I got some stick for that because um, quite a large number of people said, well, why didn't you put wine in it? And in fact, as I live in an area that has 620 different brands of local wine, that perhaps was a clamorous error. But nevertheless, I didn't want to offend anyone who perhaps doesn't like wine. Uh, also, I wanted to preserve an impression of transparency, so I fear I used water. Uh, nevertheless, we also argued quite a bit over whether uh, the metaphor, a glass half full or a glass half empty, was still a valid one. In the end, we decided that we would go with it, and it, it is valid because we certainly had a wide range, um, a spectrum of points of view about where disaster risk re reduction is going. We have the history of it, we have where it is now, but we also have opinions about where it's likely to end up and what sort of direction it is going in. And they do indeed vary from optimistic to pessimistic. Indeed, I think as you look at different parts of the problem, you could be optimistic about some and perhaps less optimistic about others. So we felt that the idea of a glass half empty or half full was, full was still very much a, a useful metaphor um, uh, and we went with it. The problem now is that we're getting yet more feedback on this and our dilemma is do we do a second edition of this which is even longer or do we try and produce a second report? Or do we find another format for the feedback from this? 
but we're very happy to receive feedback and we're very happy to put that together and at least to think about what we might do with it in terms of uh, a future um, publication or, or some means of making it accessible, accessible to readers so that um, we can present this as a dialogue that is continuing. Um, with all problems, I think we need to discuss, 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 discuss. As Winston Churchill once said about warfare, it should be jaw, 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 not war, war, war. Um, likewise, with disaster risk reduction, we, we need to take into account many different opinions. I find with both reducing the risks and responding to the events, that things tend to go best with a form of participatory democracy. In other words, the more people get involved with it, the more we listen to people, the more we take into account what their needs and their feelings are, probably the better we do. Not automatically, of course, you need structure and resources and many other things. But I think we've all had dialogues about top-down versus bottom-up and so on. Yes, of course, you need organization at a wider level, but you also need involvement. You need people to take uh, some responsibility. Indeed, I think in many respects, the, the, the challenge of the 21st century is to get people to accept more responsibility for the risks they take, where they are able to do that. Of course, there are many instances where they would accept the responsibility, but they simply don't have the resources. So I think we have to be very careful about things like fairness in disaster risk reduction and in policies and so on, uh, which means listening, which means discussing, which means talking about it together. Uh, and so that is, um, uh, I think, uh, part of the motivation for producing this report and, and uh, one of the underlying threads within it. Right, well, um, I think it's now time to get to grips with um, some uh, contrib contributors to this report and what they have to say about uh, the, some of the issues that we um, are dealing with. And I'd like to introduce Dr. Yasemin Aysan from uh, Turkey, who is going to discuss a longitudinal overview of experiences of disaster risk reduction. So Yasemin, uh, I hope you're still here and uh, hope that you're, you're still well connected. Uh, we're sorry to disturb you in a difficult no. situation today, but we're absolutely delighted to have you with Everybody. us. The, the, next, today, the, so no. <laughs> the next 10 minutes are yours. Thank you very much, uh, David. Um, I, I would like to thank you for inviting me to participate, Ian, to you and um, and also for the opportunity to participate in this meeting. And I'd like to say a few words about what I felt about the whole process and the outcome uh, very quickly. I think a lot of it is captured by Ian and David, but for me, what was the most interesting part of it was the fact that it was spontaneous, free and unstructured from the start, which is very unusual for a lot of interactions we have on DRR. I guess this type of a dialogue we ha often have amongst friends. As you and Ian were wa walking along the river, the kind of dialogue you had you know, you speak from whatever comes to your mind and one thing leads to another. In, in most other meetings, very useful, of course, but it's pre-structured and maybe more specialized people are together, etc. So this was very free floating, which created a lot of dynamics. Of course, great difficulty to turn it into a document. I felt it was very much balanced between theory and academic thinking and hands-on examples and experiences, which was really, really good. And, uh, and also the global nature of it. People participated from all kinds of different places with very different backgrounds. It was very multidisciplined, geographically very diverse, 
And that also added on. I mean, we very quickly saw what might have worked in one place might still be a problem in another place. And it's easy to make assumptions that we have progress everywhere at the same level because of the level of knowledge we have on certain topics and experience. It was challenging, I'm sure. And I think Ian really handled it extremely well. He went, he came back to us several times. So there was opportunity to correct, recorrect, uh, give an answer to a challenge which came from somebody else. And the one who challenged had the opportunity to come back. And, uh, and it was, there was no time limit. It was completely uninterrupted. And therefore the, the outcome was really, I think it, it gave the stick to us. And it was more like you are in charge and feel free to do how you want to move with it. Um, I guess I'm one of the contributors that Ian at the introduction named as um, well-seasoned, uh, I mean, uh, older generation reflections. I've been in the subject, I started in England in one of the institutions where Ian had a disaster management center and it's been almost 40 years. And uh, looking around who contributed, I know many of them, but it was well balanced between the older generation reflections and the young minds in the report. And being perhaps one of the older generation reflections and reading what others contributed, I felt that my contribution should be more in the areas where not many people talked about, and that was reflecting my older generation from my older generation hat. And for that reason, I think I prefer to focus on the need for long-term overviews and longitudinal assessments, which I believe is one of the things which is lacking in DRR. Uh, of course, there are some, but not systematically. And that creates sometimes a distorted picture of what is happening because it's easy to think something was unsuccessful or didn't work at a certain period in time, which may actually work well, which needs a few different inputs if followed up or the opposite, um, something which seems really uh, very successful, may not reach the desired objectives after a certain period of time. And there aren't enough of them. When I started my PhD, uh, together with Ian and Paul Oliver, who also worked with us, who's an anthropologist and made a lot of difference to our overview of, of the whole project. It was a British project in Turkey. And we looked at a reconstruction program 14 years later, because there were lots of problems with the Turkish post-disaster reconstruction program. And it was far more successful than what people anticipated and what happened in many different situations. And there was one other research of that type at the time by Anthony Oliver Smith, who did a similar survey, who is an anthropologist. And he looked at Yungay earthquake in Latin America. And other than these two, I don't think at that point there were any reflections so long after an intervention. And um, I worked all my uh, academic, I mean, non-academic career in orga doing organizations. And I was involved in 
many, many project designs and, and many um, uh, program designs. Many of them never had a time frame longer than three to five years in one location, three to four actually. And this is mostly because of the funding uh, restrictions and funding cycles. Later, when I stopped working at institutions, I started working as an evaluator and I faced the same thing. I was asked to evaluate projects implemented either soon after, a little time later, but at the end of the project, which is more like an accountability uh, review, I always wanted to go back and see what happened 10 years, 15 years later. Because it's very easy to make assumptions about by doing one thing in one certain place because of um, the availability of a project, the availability of funding, it is going to catch like fire and change many things in a country, in other locations, which are probably now more disaster prone than where we worked uh, automatically. And that doesn't happen always. There are so many obstacles why this doesn't happen, but we don't always analyze. I think in one area, there is a lot more systematic work, which is the assess, uh, risk assessment in um, evaluating and quantifying risk. There are many methods developed, whether it's for floods, earthquakes, whatever it may be. And there are uh, many scholars working in this area, but when it comes to risk reduction, and that work is well measured and gradually advanced over the last three, four decades. When it comes to disaster risk reduction, my sense is it's less systematic. And there are more assumptions about what risk reduction and how much risk reduction has been achieved or not. And less System, the, uh, the system is not systematically evaluated. Um, perhaps my um, consultancy experience gave me the impression that sometimes we end up doing very nice uh, pilot projects or um, cases, but we don't know how much they had influence and what happened to them in terms of uh, having a wider DRR impact. It's a little bit like, you know, acupuncture. I think with acupuncture from a few needles in your body, we can expect a bodily transformation or healing, but can we expect from acupunctures in DRR? a healing of a country or a problem or a system. I'm not sure because we do not know. And that's why I think there is need for more longitudinal work, which is difficult. Perhaps some academics at degree level are able to do it. And, and also I think a lot of it is, remains as gray literature. Uh, could I ask you to conclude then, please, as we have to um, accommodate other speakers, but thank you very much indeed for your excellent reflections that set up a series of trains of thought, for example, about how to induct younger, pe younger people into this field so that they really know what they're doing and they're properly um, briefed with what we've learned in previous generations. Let me hand over, please, to um, Ian Burton as our next speaker. Um, Ian also really needs no introduction, but he's Emeritus Professor in the Department of Geography at the University of Toronto, among many other things uh, that, that we could add to his uh, curriculum there. Um, Ian is going to talk to us about 
living with climate change, which was uh, climate change, of course, one of the drivers of disaster risk reduction was something that we did tackle quite a bit in the report. Over to you, Ian. So thank you, Yasmin, and uh, hail to Ian. Thank you. You need to unmute Ian. Unmute. Uh, we can't hear you, Ian. Can you unmute? It is on. Yes, we there we are. We can hear you now. No, not anymore. You've muted again. Ian, you need to unmute. Yes. 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 Yeah, don't touch anything. I don't touch anything else. <laughs> <clears throat> okay, well, I would like to express my great appreciation for this work, this work in progress, and um, for being invited to participate and uh, comment on the, this very um, amazing, uh, stimulating exercise. I, I must say that um, it has provoked me a lot to, uh, to think again or to rethink about disasters and disasterology and, and in, in the context of climate change and against uh, in a wider context. So I'm, I'm, I would thank and express my great appreciation to Ian and, um, and David for what they've, what they've done in putting this stimulating collection together. My contribution will, is not pessimistic, but I do think that the glass is half empty. And um, I, I think um, I would like to ca cast it as critical rather than pessimistic. And I did have some interaction with, with Ian in the early thinking about, uh, about this. And I was a little bit critical of the, of the metaphor which uh, overrides or underlies the, the whole exercise. Because I think in some ways, it's a good metaphor. I can understand why it's been kept, but also I think that um, uh, it perhaps, um, is, is limiting in some perhaps because it, it focuses attention internally, very much uh, self-examination in a sort of in, in disasterology and field, if you would excuse that, that word. Um, uh, and it's perhaps because I also think it's, it's a lot bigger than a cup. It's not a cup, it's a barrel, or if it's a, maybe even a bottomless, a bottomless pit. And as I say, it, 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 it has tended to generate this, what I think is think of as a sort of inward looking, uh, self-focused uh, collection of ideas and, 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 and so on. So I, I think in addition to this, not instead of this, but in addition to this, we need to think more about looking outward, looking at context, looking at looking forward and asking that question, what can the world learn from disaster studies, DRR, disaster, um, uh, disasterology? What do we have to say about the multiple analytical uh, apocalyptic changes that we now face? Because the world is in a period of, I would suggest, rather existential threat. So to reflect the moment about the evolution of disasterology, I would say that we have thought about disasters as acts of God, as um, this result of Mother Earth. And then we tried to control disasters as we had more science and technology. We thought, well, we can control these disasters with build embankments and flood control works and so on. But often that 
turn out to have a long-term um, adverse uh, adverse effect. And all the while we were doing that, the, 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 the aggregate costs of disasters in terms of uh, economic and property losses and so on has continued to increase and still increases. There's been quite a lot of success in the reduction of mortality and morbidity. That is true, that is a substantial achievement. But on the, on the other hand, a lot of data suggests that disaster losses have been going up and more in proportion than just total economic growth and, 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 and population growth. So we, we, we need to think critically about why the cup is, uh, why the cup is half empty and why our work hasn't been more successful than I agree than it, than it, than it has been. Um, we, we've come to understand that, uh, you know, we use the term natural disasters for a long time. We've come to understand that disasters are not natural. They're, they're a result of human decisions and human choices. Elan Kelman recently published a, a book on disasters by choice, and there's a much earlier book called Disasters by Design. So we now, I think, recognize and accepted that it's incorrect to call these natural disasters. The hazards are natural, yes. Floods and droughts and earthquakes and, and, and so on have occurred and, 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 and will occur. But, but the, the, the first the hazard and then the disaster. And the disaster is, is humanly created. Now I was asked to talk about, I was asked to talk about climate change and it, this in the context of climate change. And there comes another shift because we now recognize that because of climate change and not only climate change, the hazard events themselves are subject to change. That we are, because of climate change, um, extreme events are becoming more frequent in some cases of greater magnitude. There is greater variability in, in, in weather and climate. We're living in a much more unstable situation in which we are responsible not for the only for the disaster itself, but increasingly for the nature and the magnitude and frequency of the hazards themselves. So um, we, we now see that we've moved from this into a, 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 a system in which really we, we are in the process of creating the hazard as well as creating the as well as creating the disaster. So I, I'm a bit um, wondering if we ought not to add to the phrase disaster risk reduction. We now ought to speak of it more as well as disaster risk creation. Um, and uh, think more about what that means and, and how to address it. Well, um, it has been said, it is increasingly pointed out that we are um, living in a period of time in which you might call the Anthropocene. There is no longer the simple dichotomy between man and nature, humans and nature. We are part of the ecosystem and indeed the ecosystem is part of us. Uh, we are the ecosystem now in the in the Anthropocene. So perhaps we could think of, of other metaphors, not to replace, but to add to the metaphor of the cup, which is half full and half empty. And just to be a little provocative, uh, 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 stimulated by the rethinking that the book, the, the report brought to me, I would like to suggest that what we need to think about is domestication. Domestication, you say, what do you mean? Well. We've, we've domesticated cats and dogs, cows, sheep, goats, pigs, and so on and so forth, and, and, and brought about a world which is, um, well, much more sustainable, uh, uh, created problems in the making, solve one problem, create others, that's partly been the, the history. But in the process of domesticating our environment, we have also been domesticating ourselves. And I would suggest that the process of 
human domestication is um, a bit like the, the glass, it's, it's half empty. There's a lot more domestication of human beings to be, to be achieved. What, what do I mean by that? Well, I, I don't really know. It's a, it's a metaphor. I think we have to think about how we need to change the, the whole integrated system of humans and, and the environment and ecosystems. So in saying that we're not fully domesticated, I mean that there are still um, people around that we might think of as being wild. Well, I suppose our ancestors in the Stone Age were, in a sense, wilder and less domesticated than, than we are. But I think there are also some pretty undomesticated people in the, around the world in today. And if you look in Moscow and Washington and London and Beijing, I think you'll find plenty of examples of plenty of examples of that. So I, I am, I'm just thinking that um, uh, we need to now think about disasters and what the world can learn from our experience and what we now understand about disasters and apply that thinking to the other apocalyptic threats that we are facing in, in the Anthropocene. And so there was some talk at the beginning from, from Ian about what do we do next? Do we expand this? Do we, and I think that there might be room for a, a volume two, if you like, which says, well, what can the world learn from disasterology? What one can we teach from disasterology in the context of the zeitgeist of today, what we are now, what we are now dealing with, the, the, the multiple threats uh, that I, I, don't, I don't need to list. So, um, uh, where is my concluding thought? Can't find it. I'll try and make it up. <laughs> um, did, did evolution go astray by uh, evolving human beings? Or can we continue to evolve further so that all the world becomes a place which is, if you like, greener? Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, uh, Ian, for your, your kind words. Uh, I do feel that people ought to read not merely your more recent work, but some of your much older work, uh, which is seminal and fundamental. And to avoid reinventing the wheel and to be sure that one has the depth of knowledge in disaster risk reduction, it is important to go back to the 60s and the 70s and see what young, young toughs like Ian Burton um, were writing at that time, and much of it is still very, very good. So thank you anyway for that update. Um, do we have Professor, v, uh, Professor Vinod Sharma here? Excellent. Um, it's my pleasure to hand over to you uh, to talk about the impact of COVID on DRR and climate change adaptation <laughs> in India for 10 minutes. The floor is yours. Hello, we have you. I can't see him, David. No, in fact, uh, does not appear to be. Uh, I know that he had some um, connection issues and he may be along a little later. What we can do instead is move now to um, Alan Lavelle, who is listening in in the middle of the night in Costa Rica. Now, Alan has got some quite serious connection problems and He's just written to me to say that he'll have a go at saying his piece, but if not, then he'll write a couple of pages and we will circulate it to uh, participants uh, afterwards. So we're not going to miss uh, the wise and wonderful words of Alan Lovell, uh, even if we're unable to um, connect up and, and have them right now. But over to you, Alan, if we can, in fact, uh, get the connection going well enough. 
Well, let me see, can you hear me? Very well, actually. Oh, that's strange. That means the internet woke up in Costa Rica <laughs> sort of, since we first connected. Well, let me know if it does disappear again so that I can take the adequate measures. Um, so to try and keep within the 10 minute um, limit, um, first my sincere thanks to Ian and you, David, for the opportunity to say a few words in this launch. Um, I came late into this topic at the end of the 80s, and the people I read were amongst them were the two of you, so um, in one way or another. Um, so it's great to be able to sit here and with a whole series of other people that I deeply respect because of their contributions to this topic. Um, also, I'd like to first and um, also congratulate Anshu Manu Rajib um, for their um, awards yesterday in the Sasakawa Prize Ceremonies um, on the institutional seeds and the personal level or individual level, very well deserved contributions over time, which have been well taken upon by many people. Um, yeah, I've been asked to talk about um, this, which Ian just introduced and has been significant in promoting um, the notion of risk creation. Um, before doing that, I would just put a question on the table, which I'm not going to even try to answer, which is um, in Latin America, we tend to talk about risk construction and rarely will you see the notion of risk creation. Um, so there's a question, are these the same thing? Are they different? If we go to um, semantics, there is a difference in what creation and construction is. And maybe there's a complementarity between them. Maybe they are substitutes. I'm not going to get into debate that, but I just mentioned the point because in Latin America, you will rarely see the notion of risk creation and you will always see the notion of risk construction. Um, so I just leave that one on the table because it is worthwhile exploring more than what I've read um, in the um, um, in, in articles or publications which have come up. Um, then I'd also like to introduce something which Yasmin insinuated and um, Ian in some ways, which is um, while congratulating this report and taking it as it is, because I think it offers a unique vision of a debate between the people involved. And it is um, invaluable in many, many ways. Um, we are all conscious of the fact, and me, nearly 80 years old, Ian is 80 some odd, Ian is 80 some odd, we're yeah, probably the oldest of what is an older generation report or debate. Um, probably the average age of people, if I look through those I know, is somewhere in the mid-60s, if not approaching 70. I think the extremes are, and I'm not going to mention the extreme up, but I think <laughs> we're all near it. And the lower extreme is Elan and probably T Titus um, from the people I know, who are probably just under 50 or something like that. So it is a, 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 a debate by people that in some way have come through the whole sequence of change in approaches and understanding of disaster and particularly disaster risk. Um, and it is people that are pre, in may, most cases, the international decade and certainly Hyogo. Um, and so when the whole thing of risk construction, risk creation, the idea of development-based creation of risk started to take off in a significant fashion, even though the bases of it are our invulnerability studies in the work of O'Keefe, Ben Wisner, um, Ian, et cetera, in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. Um, but the whole idea of risk construction, risk um, as a paradigm um, coming together and bringing together a whole series of dispersed elements is basically post 90s um, from my perspective. So it really would be interesting as a follow on from this to put this in the hands of a pre 45 year old generation um, and see what their response to each of the different things is because it is significant where you come from, what you've gone through, how you've seen the changes in the way you interpret different things. So I just lay that one on the table as well as a second um, possible point of, um, of, of, of discussion. 
Then on the risk creation, risk construction one, I think most of us would accept that well, maybe using the word paradigm or paradigmatic change is a little pretentious, but certainly the whole notion of risk creation, risk construction has turned the whole topic on its head. It has introduced new elements that weren't there. It has required a reflection on new aspects that have never been reflected. And maybe um, one of the results of this is that when we ask about the glass being half full or half empty, it should not be with, re with reference to disaster risk reduction. It should be with reference to development because basically risk creation and risk um, or risk construction is based on the notion of endogenous creation of risk, not exogenous creation of risk. That is, it is not due to external events impacting innocent societies, as Ken Hewitt um, wrote so early in his writings. It is about things created within the system itself, within development itself, Systemic risk is created within the system. Consequently, the system that creates it has to be modified in order for the risk to be avoided. And that adds to the second point that risk reduction is not risk avoidance. Risk reduction, like weight reduction, is something you do when you've got it, not preventing it in the future. You don't talk about weight reduction when you're trying to avoid weight. And consequently, you know, maybe what we're talking about is the glass half full or half empty as far as development of sustainability of models that are consequent with human welfare, et cetera, in the future. Um, and so when we get into the whole risk creation and risk construction thing, you know, it opens up, I'm not sure whether this is a Spanish phrase translated to English or an English phrase, which I learned when I was in England most of my life, uh, early life, you know, opens up a can of worms. And a can of worms associated with people, with different perspectives, different positions, different ideas, different notions, in such a way that it is important not only to think about measuring, monitoring, evaluating risk as the probability of future loss and damage, to just put it in a, a concise form. It is about understanding risk in the sense that World Bank has this discussion ongoing. But understanding risk means understanding why people, poorer people who are offered the chance to relocate from hazard prone areas, refuse it or why Toyota and um, others were located in the floodplains of the River Chapraya and probably know very well what they were doing or maybe didn't know what they were doing. But in the end, risk involves a whole series of decisions which fall outside of the comprehension of technical people and te um, technocrats, etc., and is based on what life is all about for those people. Consequently, the whole risk creation, risk um, construction thing demands a new look at things. It need, demands turning things upside down. It demands listening to people. It demands co-production of knowledge, that is, talking to the people that are affected by or create risk. It demands talking about moral hazard. You know, a lot of what we saw with Fukushima, with Chapraya, or with many others is about moral hazard, that is people creating risk to their own benefit and transferring it to third parties um, without those third parties being really conscious of what is happening. So there are a whole series of things I think around this. And as I reiterate to finalize this, um, the whole risk creation, risk construction thing is critical. It puts the debate in the center of development debates. Risk is generated within these processes and without a change in these processes or recognition that these processes create unnecessary risk, maybe they do create risks that could be limited even following the same development parameters, or maybe it does need a twist and a turn in the development parameters themselves. I'm not sure I'm not going to get into that debate. But basically, I think the risk creation, risk construction one, which will follow into the future, which is generated and has been generated in more recent times in a more consolidated fashion, is where this topic has to go. Because we cannot live constantly trying to reduce risk that was created in other epochs and which costs one hell of a lot of money 
we have to be able to do something to avoid putting new risk in infrastructure, in livelihoods um, on the table, and which involves also a strong consideration of changing environmental parameters associated with things such as climate change, as Ian has, uh, has brought to the forefront. So I'll finish with that, and I'm glad that the sound came back. Um, thank you very much for the opportunity, and it is getting light here now. Goodbye. Well, uh, Alan, we're really grateful for that awesome overview of essential and important topics, um, and also that, that, that you did that even before dawn, uh, which I think many of us admire as well. Um, Trains of thought that it set off. One was that um, there's one person missing today, uh, who is Terry Cannon, who is in fact at this precise moment on a train speeding through France, uh, which is why he was not able to be here. But Terry and I have put together a discussion group that we called the Radix Group. And the idea was to hold monthly discussions about disaster related themes with anyone who'd like to come along who has minimal expertise, that's master's students, PhD, undergraduates if they wanted, uh, professional people, NGO people, anyone. Um, and we hold this outside university because we wish to be beholden to no one and have this completely independent and also drink beer and wine if we wish to. Um, and uh, we've been doing this for about eight years. We've been severely disrupted by the pandemic, but um, there were two objectives, really. One was to act as a sort of safety valve and uh, have the opportunity to exchange ideas. And the other was to hand on the torch to a younger generation. Um, perhaps a third objective was that we oldies could listen to the younger people and learn something, uh, not only the other way around. Um, at the moment, we're a bit in crisis because the format of discussion is changing very substantially with um, the kind of thing that we're doing right now. Um, webinars are proliferating all over the place, which may or may not be a good thing, uh, but I would very much like to get back to the face-to-face -face discussion where we actually sit round in a very relaxed format and we, we, we listen to each other I think one of the things we don't teach in universities, two things we don't teach, one is how to look and one is how to listen. How to listen, terribly important, and, and, um, and really there's no emphasis on it. Uh, so that's one uh, thread of thought that this set off. And another is that I rather believe that we need an order of magnitude increase in the activities related to disaster risk reduction. Now, my own particular field is emergency planning and management. And we do that often in a tremendously amateurish, slapdash way. Um, there is now a great deal of initiative and, 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 and um, pressure to um, apply science to the management of disasters and the reduction of disaster risk. That's great. Actually, what we are trying to do is also promote the idea of disaster science as actually the science of doing things with disasters. In other words, not seismology, volcanology, um, geomorphology, and so on, all of that very important, but actually making more rigorous and more scientific the process of preparing for responding to and recovering from disaster. Uh, applying more rigorous standards to it and, and, and developing that as not merely a discipline, but actually a, a form of science. Uh, and that's something I would like to see happen in the future. But anyway, I'm going on too long. Thank you, Alan, for that. Now, we don't appear to have uh, Dr. Sharma uh, with us. So let's move straight into question and answer or discussion format. And anyone who'd like to ask any of us, not merely Ian and myself, uh, but also um, our speakers of today or other participants in this event um, and, and contributors to the report, or make any observations about disaster risk reduction and the future and the past and the present, please go ahead.
I think Ian is trying to say something. Ian Davis is trying to say something, but unless he unmutes, we will not be able to hear him. Can you hear me now? Absolutely. Just to provoke some of those friends who contributed. I see Paul Venton there. I see Steve Bender. Uh, Mikio Ishiwatari is in Bali. And anyone who contributed, would you like to just add any comment? Um, Ian, can you hear me? Yes, Yasmin in, in Tehran, yeah. a brilliant PhD student. Yes, always your PhD student. First of all, um, I was not supposed to... Unmute, Yasmin. I just uh, wanted to say a few words. Just first of all, I would like to thank uh, Ian, you and David uh, for compiling this. Uh, oh, I, I, can, I can imagine how difficult it was to compile all these, you know, uh, discussions and various uh, uh, topics into one uh, very precious, um, uh, I say, report that I'm sure, at least for me and uh, the students I uh, introduced the report, they, uh, they told me that they learned a lot from the conversations and the dialogue that uh, people have from different countries. So uh, thanks very much for this. And um, uh, about the report, I um, myself strongly support and um, really see the need for um, this disaster risk reduction dialogues to uh, go on further. At least for my uh, um, point of view, for, uh, for the um, uh, thing I learned about public awareness, I, I remember uh, uh, 17, 18 years ago when I did my PhD with Ian in Cranfield University, there was not a lot of information about uh, these issues and disaster risk reduction. And um, I can see Ian and David are um, almost the pioneers of uh, bringing this issue. And nowadays it's, it, there, it, there is a really a need for um, a strong, uh, you know, practical and uh, pragmatic momentum to uh, move, you know, this, uh, to um, um, pr progress in these actions and um, issues like preparedness, response and things like that. So I think there, there's a lot of uh, more to do. And we, um, you know, by, do, by uh, working on these dialogues and speaking together from uh, various experts from different countries, um, this, this will be, this dialogue can continue. And I, I'm, I'm sure more and more uh, challenges, uh, you know, needs and everything can come out of these uh, things that we are doing. This is just the beginning. So I. I really appreciate again the, the work that Ian started and uh, all the experts uh, continue and uh, took time for that and hope uh, that this can uh, um, pro progress more and more in future year, years for other students and other young experts to use in this field. Thanks very much. Thank you, Yasmin. Thank you, Yasmin. Ian, you called on my name, um, so just very briefly, a big thank you. Um, but I, I noticed that um, Dr. Sharma has actually just joined us, so I just want to point that out to you. Righty ho. Um, here we have uh, Dr. Vinod Sharma, who is, I'm sorry, I'm slightly... Um, there we go, Senior Professor in Disaster Management at the Indian Institute of Public Administration. And um, Dr. Sharma, welcome. We're glad to have you with us. And I wonder if you'd like to give us 10 minutes of your wisdom um, in order to complete our roundup today. And thanks, Paul, for pointing that out. Thank you very much, uh, David, and uh, my apologies that uh, I joined, you know, I was the first one with Yasmin, you know, I joined, but uh, there is a workshop going on, and uh, so I was attending both sides, <laughs> but thank you very much that you uh, gave me this opportunity. Thanks, Ian, that uh, uh, you selected me, you know, for this brief intervention. Um, I will say first uh, about the paper. 
In fact, uh, uh, the paper is not uh, 135 or 140 pages. I think it is more than 1400 pages. And uh, uh, there is a, you know, it need uh, really a, uh, I mean, a person to read each and every word of this paper because it is written by, uh, you know, experienced people who have worked in this area, who have seen, you know, disasters in, in they, get, they have given changes which they have seen. They have seen, you know, where we were and what we are, where we are going. So I think uh, this is not a paper actually, this is a sort of guideline to me. And uh, this is giving direction, you know, to the young scientists and young people. Uh, so for me, this is uh, altogether unique. And I read, you know, the entire paper and uh, observed that uh, uh, disaster risk reduction, you know, and particularly in last two, three decades, you know, the changes which we have seen, this is amazing, amazing changes. And I will speak, you know, about my experiences in India. And uh, I have mentioned in, in paper also, but uh, as if I uh, comment on paper, uh, I will say that as a senior professor of disaster management, that this is a basically guideline, you know, to the researchers. It's a guideline, you know, to people who are interested in, in this subject. It's a guideline for policymaker. So I think because uh, these are not experiences, they are giving the gaps. Where are the gaps and what we should do? What can be done, uh, you know, by, uh, by the academics, by researchers, by community, and I think this this kind of uh, observation, this kind of uh, research paper, in fact, I have not read. I have read so many books of disaster risk reduction, disaster management, but this paper was really unique for me, and I uh, thank you know all the uh, contributors and particularly Anne Davis, you know who. Uh, uh, synthesize, you know, the uh, ideas which is given by different people, different uh, authors, and give it a shape. And that's why I was mentioning to, uh, you know, some of our students, you know, who are working in this area, that uh, why it is important, why you should download this paper, why this paper will become, uh, you know, important for your research. Uh, so all these points I have mentioned to them also. Friends, I think uh, this, uh, uh, they are not four uh, speakers, but uh, we are speaking on behalf of others also who are uh, not here. Uh, for example, when I am giving examples of India, I started working in this area in 1992, and uh, that was the IDNDR. And uh, I, I remember that uh, uh, the things were altogether different. This subject was in Ministry of Agriculture and uh, you know that India is facing mainly floods and droughts and uh, uh, the whole focus was relief centric. And uh, uh, we were just talking relief. When there was flood is over, we were giving relief to the farmers, to the people affected and then wait for another flood. Same thing is drought and droughts were turning into famines. And I think that kind of scenario was there. But now, uh, you know, after IDNDR and I give this, uh, in fact, I prepare, you know, four or five slides in case you uh, allow me, uh, because uh, uh, that will be, uh, that will give me opportunity, you know, to, uh, uh, tell you more systematically. Can I just project four or five slides, uh, David? Yes. Um, okay. I will have to hand over to you. Uh, uh, actually, I I'm disabled. Uh, you know, yes, I'm, 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 if you can I'm do that, I will be grateful. Trying to. Mm. Sorry. 
No problem. In case uh, uh, Megan, right, you should now be co-host so that you can put a slide up. Okay. Okay. Hopefully. Yeah, that's right. Thank you. So this is uh, uh, basically, uh, as I was telling about the paper, that uh, people see everything, you know, from their own uh, viewpoint. And uh, for me, you know, this is a glass, uh, uh, you know, slightly uh, more than half full, I should say. Uh, and I, I see that empty space is there, but it is much less than, uh, you know, so uh, as I uh, mentioned that uh, the country is highly vulnerable uh, for disasters and uh, we were having all kind of disasters except volcanoes. There is hydroclimatic hazards, geological, man-made now, there are threats, you know, for chemical, biological, and uh, we have seen the challenges of uh, COVID. So uh, the vulnerability is very high and uh, with climate change, I think the hydroclimatic hazards and their frequency and the losses, which is, uh, it's increasing tremendously. It's not only in India, but I think the, in, in, in the entire world, but I'm just speaking uh, for, um, I mean, this is my experience, which we are seeing. Pre-IDNDR era, I, as I uh, told you, that uh, the focus was relief. It, and more, mainly there are four disasters, flood, drought, landslide, and uh, I know earthquake. Cyclones are, were there, and there, there was a you know calendar that in these months there may be cyclone, but now I think there is no, uh, that calendar is not valid. Earlier it was only Bay of Bengal, but now even the Arabian Sea, we are getting cyclones. Now there is a big uh, threat, you know, for forest fire. And uh, this is increasing. Earlier it was in one or two states. And now we have seen that in the month of April, we had fire in Rajasthan. You know, Rajasthan uh, forest, we had this thing. If I divide it into two parts, because not decade wise, but I think pre, uh, during the IDNDR and beyond IDNDR, I think before that we did something and Ian uh, knows uh, very well that uh, we created the National Center for Disaster Management and Ian Davis played a very important role in that, conceptualizing what we should do. In fact, he sent one uh, you know, uh, expert David was uh, invited by government of India, and uh, because uh, Ian nominated him, and he prepared a blueprint for NCDM that what we should do, what should be our focus, research areas, training. You know, so we we uh, so he is associated, you know, from that time uh, with Indian uh, research and uh, training. So mitigation, I think we were not, not talking about mitigation those days, but yes, training, capacity building that we started and we convince authorities that yes, it need funding. Preparedness cannot be there, you know, just by talking. Yeah. Um, Henry. Oh, Sherry. Yes. Uh, you know, yes. Sherry. Yes. 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 And then the, uh, you know, beyond identity, after identity, we had this disaster management act and uh, the NDMA was created and honorable prime minister become, uh, you know, the chairperson of NDMA. Every state, you know, the honorable chief minister is the head of the STMA, which is the state disaster management authority. 
we have district disaster management authorities and there are two unique thing which happen in india that is the ndrf a specialized force and we have 12 battalions which are dedicated to uh, disaster response i think this is unique and uh, we are spending you know a lot of money and uh, you know there are specialized forces and specialized training given to them then the nidm i think the new challenges and covid 19 we it taught us so many things you know and that was this was a new disaster uh, which we never you know realized it was new virus no medicine no knowledge you know how to handle this but i think disaster management act th this helped a lot and uh, then the political leadership and particularly honorable prime minister you know how he handled this whole thing and uh, lead this nation i think that was amazing and we could uh, see that uh, in case there is a uh, uh, you know clarity in the leadership then the things get much easy and during this covid we face series of natural calamities we were having many cyclones we were having cyclone amphan we were in 21 22 every year we were having cyclones but how to handle it in covid situation that was unique flood situation i think the urban floods and all that you know this was there forest fire was there heat and cold waves were there and i think the, uh, what i want to say is that during this two years this is a new chapter you know in disaster management and this new chapter we learned a lot that uh, uh what can be done and what are the new areas and what kind of capacity building you know required you know in the nation as i already told you that our glass is more than half full and in india i say with proud that education this is uh, uh, you know we have started from school level and i can give example of my own state sikkim where i am working as vice chairman of sikkim state disaster management authority all the schools in basic education we have introduced disaster what are the hazards what are the impact of these hazards how hazard change you know into disasters in higher education today in india about 26 universities are giving degrees Higher uh, education, Amrita University. You know, Madam is uh, attending the program. You know, you can see that how much interest they have in landslide and uh, you know geo hazards and all these. So PhD programs started, and it, it's an interdisciplinary thing. Somewhere you it, you will see in geography department, in some universities geology department. in some universities in psychology department so i think this is very unique thing and i liked it it's not a disaster management subject per se but in uh, all these uh, it's it become interdisciplinary thing and sikkim i think i am working there since last you know 10 years and i have gone up to the panchayat community level and this is the one state where community is being trained you know for risk reduction community is empowered community is given money you know that and you prepare your own plan i think that kind of thing we have started so this disaster awareness i think this level in case somebody measure it uh, i think it is much much better than uh, you know last 30 years when we started working in this area the school safety program of the government awards you know they have started giving awards to individual to organizations to ngos and this is a big encouragement for people working in this area now climate change and risk reduction we are talking that the both thing should go hand in hand and uh, then the coordination between the state and the uh, so i think these are some of the things which are happening in india and we like that and we will ian you have contributed a lot you know when i will write about the historical part i will definitely mention that 
in 1995 when we were making ncdm you spend your time without any money you mentored us you know and you give us a sort of guidelines that what can be done what kind of training what should be the methodology and your project urban risk reduction the young people who you started you know guiding you know what is disaster risk reduction they got the sasakawa award yesterday so i think this is this award uh, i think part of it you know you are responsible because you encourage them and uh, you identified area of research after ladur earthquake so this i say that you have done it even now your contribution with amrita university with indian institute of public administration your association with sikkim and guiding force you know with seeds i think i salute you and i uh, always feel that you are with us and whenever we stuck somewhere you will help us thank you my last uh, uh, you know slide is this and i will say that uh, uh, i think i will uh, stop here uh, because there are other things you know which i Uh, uh, i will not like to mention here but in uh, this is very much you know related to this paper because uh, my entire journey uh, i i can see that where we were uh, 30 or 35 years back and where we are today today we are talking about you know cdri there are many nations you know who are joining us and uh, i think this kind of in initiation by uh, honorable prime minister by the uh, you know chief ministers of several states i think this awareness become a important point in in india and now i am sure that this in 15 finance commission they have given us money for disaster mitigation now money is available at central level and state level and uh, i am very glad that Uh, you know we were just talking about preparedness mitigation but there was no money but today i can say that the money is available and uh, uh, there is a funding which is provided you know provision is there by the finance commission and they have given money to this central government as well as to the state government i stop I here definitely yes. i will i will uh, come Uh, you know whenever there is any question to me thank you very much thank you thank you indeed uh, for your um, wise words and, and comments uh, we are technically out of time but if you'd be so kind as to give us another few minutes we have a couple of uh, questions here um, and a few uh, concluding words the first question is to ian davis and it's from maggie stevenson and it is what surprised you the most in the answers you got to your original question or through the process or what provoked the most thought in you well it's a very good question maggie maggie from ireland raising this question and i've been pondering it since you typed it out i i think i was very surprised by the diversity of the responses can you all hear me You're, yes um the i i didn't expect there to be such um a fantastic range of opinions um and and it, i was very humbled by that because i thought i thought i knew this subject fairly well but i began to realize that there were great chunks of it that i was incredibly ignorant of it might be that i'm old in the tooth and that's the problem but uh, so i think that the, the point david made at the beginning about needing to listen and look harder uh i just needed to think about that myself i i learned so much from the interaction in fact at times i thought i'd like to keep this going for about the next 3 or 4 years as long as i'm still alive but that might be a bit self indulgent so it's best to call a halt on it but um as i sent back the responses to people then more came and more came and more people joined in i just realized that we're in a very rich extraordinary environment and it's complicated and as 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 Ian Burton said um 
it's it's very dangerous. It's getting very worrying, our world. I mean, in many ways, the risks in the 70s seem quite small beer compared to now, but the population has radically different. Urbanization has had a massive impact and we've got all these challenges, but just as my good friend Vinod Sharma has just been saying, countries have responded. If we compare India now with what India was like in 1975, it's extraordinary to think of the change and the phenomenal uh, attention that's been given to this subject to meet with a growing problem. So I suppose the answer to Maggie's question is a bit of humility on my part. I think I learned it was much more complicated a subject than I was aware of. Um, I began to question my own understanding of it. And I thought I've got to be a bit more humble here in future writing, not to assume things. I was making assumptions, which I think were, were often incorrect. I also want to pick up something Yasmin said, and she said, we need to do these um, longer term evaluations. I had a remarkable experience in India with Mihir Bhatt uh, a few years back, where we returned to Malkonji, a small village in Latour, which had been devastated in 1993 earthquake. We went back 15 years later, and we were staggered by the progress that had been made. Um, so many assumptions we'd made were incorrect. And it made me realize that unless we can get these longitudinal studies where we look back over time, we're going to carry on making many, many mistakes in what we look at. So that was a colossal learning experience. Um, I think the other thing that I learned from the study, going back to Maggie's question, was just how different it is to see a problem when you're, as it were, detached from it. And here we are in England, we've got COVID problems, and but we don't have these hazard problems that threaten so many lives in India and China and places where you are where you are today. And I, I think that um, I realised we need to listen so much harder to people within these countries. And one of the exciting things that's happening is the initiative is shifting. It's shifting away from the US, from Canada, from Britain, from Europe from Australia, and we're getting more and more people within the countries which are so hazard prone, expressing views and writing and commenting, and webinars are helping this process. And so we've, we've got to, the baton's been passed and we're exciting watching this new environment at work. So lots of changes, Maggie, lots of things I didn't expect, lots of ponderings, lots of uh, challenges really. And uh, thank you very much for the question. Um, here's a picture of Ian uh, when he and I visited the area of southern Italy affected by the 1980 earthquake some 31 years later and that was really quite an interesting experience because it was in some ways a little bit surreal. There had been 14 different models of reconstruction and some of them have been rather more successful than others. Um, but it was a great learning experience for us both. But what made it particularly a good learning experience was an ability to learn not merely from the environment we were looking at, but from each other. I suppose if you extend that to the report, it rather amazed me that anyone could navigate their way authoritatively through a subject as complex as this. But the fact that 37 people did and at their head uh, the, the firm and wise steering of Ian Davis, I think, really uh, amazed me even more. Um, time is extremely short. Uh, we do need to conclude very quickly. But there was one other question uh, to be put to uh, all of us, and, and that is, um, Alan made a suggestion, Alan Lavelle made the suggestion to take this dialogue to the people under the age of 45, um, how, how will their responses, how are their responses likely to be different to those of us of the older brigade? Any thoughts, anyone? David, may I say something? Please. Um, when I was in Oxford, we did a lot of training and probably we were pretty much the same age at the time. 
And later, when a new generation of people came to study, and also with the proliferation of training courses all over the world, I had a few interactions with the new people. And what I felt is like, I often felt, well, we know this, you know, why it's a question. There are tons of things written on it and so much is said and done. But I concluded that like children, I think people learn by doing and from their own experiences. Uh, the fact that we know, our generation knows that whole history of 30, 40, 50 years does not mean that it translates as a quick reality uh, in, in the minds of the young people. Yes, they know the essence, but I think people have to go through certain paths, have their own experiences and test it at least. I think they're luckier than us in terms of the amount of material available to read and what is accessible compared to us, one can also argue whether that's a plus or a minus because <laughs> the downside of it is so much looks predetermined that you have to accept this model and that model and you explain the world of risk reduction or risk through these lenses. And yes, there are many new things and uh, people, uh, there are challenges in that area too, but I, I don't know. I mean, I, 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 I guess the best thing I felt is to encourage them to be involved to do. I don't know the opportunities for people to work. Sometimes I get calls or mails from new young people that I worked with, but mostly from the UK, uh, trying to get some field experience, for example. It's very difficult. Um, maybe the, the world was different. We had more opportunities. And because I think it's such a subject that one can learn by attending courses, reading books, being interested up to a point. But the test ground is like you say, you go to freely and walk around and you see a different reality. Right. Do right. I don't know if it's part of your courses. I, I, I'm very detached now from how the subject is taught, but. Thank you for those reflections. Um, I would like to apologize to Deval van Dijker for the fact that we really did not include enough uh, input into the report from African scholars, absolutely right. Would you like to say something on that, Deval? Oh, thank you so much, um, David. I mean, first of all, um, my comment wasn't so much on, on that from the African scholars, I understand the complexity of it. But um, I think from this interim generation, I found myself just on this 50. So Alan, I just fall under the, call it the new generation and yourself. Um, first of all, I think to express my gratitude to all of you for, for walking in front of us. Uh, I think there's this, in certainly my generation of scholars, you're the first ones to be thinking in these lines and we've learned such a lot from you. And, and I think I, I'll probably speak on behalf of everyone my age in, in this category to say we, we salute you for what you've done and how you've grown the, the field of disaster risk reduction. Uh, I've also been through a process of, of seeing how it grows from disaster response, but your generation has definitely been the one walking in front of us. And um, it reminds me constantly of standing on the shoulders of giants, being able to do what we do because of what you've done. And uh, I think that's more my comment focusing on, <laughs> on the context of what, what's been discussed. But I do feel that you can really be proud of, of what you've done and how this, this field has grown so far. And um, this is just a salute from my side to say thank you for what you've done. And I hope that, um, I mean, this will be a conversation that carries on and then bring in this new generation and this total proliferation of information that we now sit with in the various mix and the complexity of the different systems. Um, but I mean, there's been progress because of what you've been, been doing all your life. And I just want to say thanks to, to the scholars for that. 
I'd yeah. like to thank everyone. I think it's time that we really must draw this to a close as we were meant to end about a quarter of an hour ago. Um, but it's been a fascinating dialogue. And moreover, I'm somewhat amazed that we've managed to keep it going, bearing in mind that we're hailing from all parts of the world. And that means spanning a furiously large uh, difference in um, time zones, among other things, as well as all the questions of uh, how to connect. But we've done it. And the fuel of this whole exercise, including everything about the report, has been goodwill. Um, and with that, we've achieved a great deal, and a great deal more can be achieved in the future. I think that really is my last comment. Would you like to add something to Randa Sophie and Davis? Well, just to say what a joy it's been to hear all these different comments from people. And uh, and many of you made a big effort to be here today. Thank you, Yasmin, for being here from your hospital in, in Bodrum in Turkey. We really appreciate that. And thank you so many for getting up at unearthly hours. And, and, and good wishes to all of you in, in Bali as you're having this important conference. That's fantastic. Warm congratulations to those of you who just got this award. We just hope that will be a huge blessing to you and to other people. And, and a special thanks to Amrita University for their hosting of this project, of this launch, and also UCL. And thank you, David, for your facilitation. It's been a great pleasure. And, and I have many bits ringing in my ears as I leave. I'm thinking about what Ian Burton said about domestication. Wow. That's a new, a new concept altogether. I'm thinking of domestication of risk and how that can relate. I've got to wrap my head around that. And Alan in, in Costa Rica reminding us of development being the kind of essence of it and how we ourselves are right in the center of this process. We are part of the, as Ian mentioned, the ecology. So lots of challenges just in the last hour and a half. And thank you, Vinod. In, in India for all those lovely slides and all the hard work you put on on that. And, and thank you uh, to all those who've taken part today. We really appreciate it. I feel very honored and very blessed and most grateful to you also. Good wishes to everyone in your work. And, and we're, doing, we're, we're doing something very important, trying to reduce people's risks. It's a big struggle, but uh, I think um, as I leave, my cup is kind of more than half full. <laughs>